Right, I'm going to introduce Dean. We are thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dean is a writer and performance poet of Cypriot and Jamaican descent. Um, he was brought up in London, went to Sussex Uni, where he studied philosophy and English. And his poetry often deals with questions around identity and social justice. If you keep an eye on social media, Dean is everywhere. Seriously, you're on everything. I've, I've seen you a few times on things, but you are everywhere. Um, but The Black Flamingo, unbelievably, is Dean's first novel. There it is, I've got it here. Um, you've, written a poet, you've written poetry before, you are a poet, um, but this is your first novel. It's had extraordinary success. Um, it won the 2020 Stonewall Children's and Young Adult Literature Award and it was shortlisted for this year's Carnegie Award, the prestigious Carnegie for the best young adult book in the country. Um, the winner was announced last week and sadly Dean didn't win but you were on the shortlist and actually the real award is the Shadowers Award which isn't going to be announced till October. So don't worry, the Shadowers Award is when students and young people vote for their favourite book. Oh. And sometimes to me, that means more than just <laughs> what the librarians choose who are on the judging panel. So you never know. Um, the Black Flamingo is told in verse. It's a narrative novel, narrative verse. And it tells the story of Michael, who's a young Greek Cypriot Jamaican boy growing up in London and coming to terms with his identity as a mixed race gay teenager. It's a journey of discovery, friendships, schools, and finding yourself. So welcome, Dean. We're really honored to have you with us. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for that lovely introduction. So much thought and care <laughs> went into that. I can hear that was all your own words. So many times. <laughs> it wasn't my own words. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, you forced it very well because um, usually I can tell if someone's lifted a, uh, a bio directly from somewhere. I know where it's yeah, from. Because yeah, well, I, I mixed and matched. I mixed and matched. <laughs> there you go. The best way to plagiarise is to not do it from one source. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> never <laughs> plagiarise, students. Never plagiarise. Wrong message, Dean. Wrong message. Don't listen. Don't listen. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so because we've had problems getting hold of the book as well, and also the kids aren't, students aren't in school, um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit, start off by telling us a little bit about The Black Flamingo and also yeah. what led you to write it. Okay, um, so The Black Flamingo is about Michael and as you said he's a mixed race gay teenager growing up in London. Um, you meet him at the beginning of the book when he's six years old um, but he, most of the book is a teenager so he kind of quickly grows up and you see some important things from his childhood, but then we quickly get to his teens. And in his teens is where he really comes into himself and starts to figure out his identity. Um, especially when he goes to university, he starts embracing um, different parts of his identity that he hadn't before, um, mostly drag performance. And um, that's kind of, it's right there on the cover. So it's not like a, a, a spoiler to say that he becomes a drag performer. Um, but the book is kind of like building up to that moment of him stepping on stage for the first time and um, becoming the Black Flamingo, and uh, which is his drag alter ego. Um, and so for me, the Black Flamingo um, came into my life in 2015. I do perform in drag as the Black Flamingo, um, but that happened because I went to Cyprus to visit my family and um, we saw a real Black Flamingo there. And um, the metaphor of that, the image of that spoke to me about um, being black and gay and feeling like you stand out in lots of different spaces. And so I started writing about that in poetry form about myself. And then um, kind of it veered into not being about me anymore. And it kind of took on a life of its own. And Michael and the Black Flamingo as a character were kind of created. and. Um, my agent, so I have a writing agent, and she kind of was really keen on me exploring writing for young adults because uh, my poetry collection before this is for adults. And um, 
I go into schools a lot and they ask, can we get your book? And I'm like, mm, I don't know, it's, it's, it's quite grown up. <laughs> like, and so um, yeah. the, the kind of idea was that I would write something that was more, um, you know, looking at teenagers and um, those experiences. And so I did begin by reflecting on my own teenage life, but I had to realize that things have changed a lot since I was a teenager. So then I had to do more research and start looking at what it's like to be a teenager today. And um, I did workshops in schools and I spoke to lots of young people from LGBT youth groups. And I went back to my old university and stayed on campus and met with lots of students and spoke to them about their experiences now. So a lot of research went into making it not a memoir, not an autobiography, but actually um, something about this character that I'd kind of created almost by accident. Um, and then, yeah, it all kind of started falling into place once I started speaking to people and writing and, and sharing it as I went along. So it's quite collaborative as a process because, um, you know, I'd write um, a few chapters and then share them with a group of students um, at a school or at a university. I had an editor and she helped me build the story as we went along. And um, yeah, so though some of the um, kind of characteristics of Michael may be similar to me, his life is um, quite different, I'd say, in the terms of he's come into his own um, at a, as a teenager. And I don't think I really came into my own mm -hmm. until my late 20s or early 30s. <laughs> That's so. interesting, because when he gets to secondary school, he's definitely gay. At secondary school, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah and he's very I confident. Gonna, mm, I was going to ask how autobiographical. Well, I think you're. Yes. You're. How long have you been teaching? Um, do you remember section twenty eight? Mm. Yeah, so yeah. for me, um, I think I didn't have the positive role models in school. I didn't have a group like you have um, in your school. And I didn't, teachers didn't feel particularly empowered to talk to me um, in a positive way about sexuality. And so I knew, I didn't know much um, and I didn't have many role models and I didn't have many books or um, things that I could look to for positive representation of gay people. And because, you know, my mom, you know, grew up through the 80s and so she also, um, you know, was aware of the HIV crisis and that was a big thing that terrified her. And so there was so much uh, negative things for me around being gay when I was younger. And I think it's less so now. And I'm really grateful that um, we've kind of made a lot of progress in that area that we can be more um, inclusive and more supportive um, for LGBT um, young people. And so I wanted that to be reflected in the book. So if I'd written my own memoir, it would have been a lot sadder. <laughs> and I wanted to write a happy book. I was so, I think we need happy books for everyone, but I feel in particular, we need some happy books for, um, for gay teens to see themselves. I think that really, that really struck me when I read the book that um, I had to Google how old you were, Dean, because I read the book and thought a lot of these experiences I remember from my, from me growing up, but then some of it, it I could tell where you've done some research into sort of modern gay life now, because some of it just seems so modern. I had to look and think, actually, you're, you know, you're not an 18 year old person with a really modern experience. But I think you're right. I think we talked to a lot to the students about section 28 and how different it was for, for people growing up in that time. So I think it's lovely that you've managed to capture that so, so well. What do you want the book to say to young people growing up today? Because I still think there's, there's such a lack of representation in young adult fiction, even now, you know, 4% of published works feature a BAME author or a BAME character. Mm. And so what, what do you think the, the significance of the Black Flamingo is? now? Um, I think my hope was that um, there'd be some people that would see themselves in Michael's story and see his journey and the love and support that he gets and um, there'd also be people who are allies to LGBT people that see how important that love and support is so mm -hmm. whether it's a parent whether it's a friend that they know um, that their words, positive or negative, will have an effect on that person. So um, kind of being careful with what you say, but also, you know, apologizing if you make a mistake. Like lots of the characters say 
the wrong thing or, or, or silly things and then realize later on. And so it was important for me, for people to be able to make mistakes, but then to maybe realize them, apologize and move forward from that point. So I didn't have any heroes and villains in the book. I had hopefully characters that have, um, you know, lots of nuance to them. Um, but my overall hope was that either you'd feel empowered by it because you could relate or you'd, you'd learn from it and feel in an empathetic way and hopefully also just enjoy the story. Um, so those were my main hopes. And, you know, if I could put the book in a time machine, I'd love to have had it when I was a teenager. So I was kind of thinking of myself as well and thinking when I was younger, what kind of story would I have loved to have? And this is, this is it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's true. Have, have any of you students managed to see a copy of the book or have a little look at some of it? Do you want to say anything, Sarah? Do you <laughs> want to give yourself? Yeah, I read it and I loved it. And I like, I really love poetry and I liked how, because it was in poems, the way you flowed between the sections was like completely different. And like, you could tell him growing up in the poems, even if it was like written at a weird, like a, di a different order. Um, so yeah, I really liked the fact that it was in poems, yeah. Um, why did you particularly choose to write the Black Flamingo in verse? Um, because I don't think I'd have handled a prose novel. <laughs> I'm, I'm dyslexic and I um, haven't, up until recently, like I hadn't read lots of novels and I was always quite terrified of big books and so poetry was my kind of uh, the place I felt I could express myself best um, because there's there's less words and you have to get straight to the point and um, you kind of go to the heart of you know the matter so you kind of deal directly you jump into the moment and you just see what's happening and you, you kind of deal with emotion especially in a first person voice you can really kind of be there with that person in that experience directly and so you can put yourselves in their shoes so I've written lots of poetry before now where I'd hope um, it would help people understand me as a person and um, whether it was like writing poems about my dad not being around or, or being gay or, or kind of my views on inequality in the world. Um, but with, yeah, The Black Flamingo, I wanted to do that and I was excited to write in verse for other voices as well. So, you know, writing the mom and writing the sister and the best friend and the uncle and, the, and, and all the other characters that he encounters in the book, it was really fun for me to try out different voices. Um, and I'd had a taste of that before because I've written some plays. And um, so I, I, I've kind of been used to writing other voices, um, but this was bringing different kind of skills from different places together, I guess. But I think the reason I wrote a verse novel is because it was kind of slightly out of my comfort zone, but not completely. Like writing an extended piece was scary, but doing it as a poem at a time, um, you know, then it felt more manageable. So I kind of approached each section of the book like an individual poem. Um, and actually I wrote pieces as they came to me rather than writing chronologically. I knew the overall story, but I didn't write it from start to finish. I kind of wrote the bits I was excited or inspired to write and then kind of put them in order and then filled in the, the bits that I'd missed out. Um, but then obviously you have to go back and rework it because it's not as smooth that way, but that was my process. I felt like with all the aesthetics of the book, of like drag and also like, all the drawings in it. Why do you think it's important for you to celebrate like who you are using like glamour and beauty and drama? Um, why? Because it feels good and um, it grabs people's attention and it gives you a sense of, um, I think when you put on makeup or put on a costume, there's so much um, that you can do or so much that I feel I can do that I wouldn't do in my playing clothes or without the makeup. It just gives me an extra bit of confidence. And um, I think, especially when you do it on a stage, you know, you get a bit more respect than maybe when you're walking down the street. Like if I wore um, my drag walking down the street, I don't know what the reaction would be. But when I'm on the stage in a safe venue where people have come to see it, it's just so empowering. And um, so I think having those safe spaces is really important or making a space safe for people. So, you know, in the book, uh, Michael talks about the drag society that meet once a week, but they don't 
um, meet in a special room. They meet in a regular room that's part of the university building, but when they meet, it becomes a safe space. And so I think it's the people within the space that make it safe and the agreement that you have amongst yourselves. Um, so I feel that about lots of the LGBT venues I go to and also um, the kind of um, other spaces that kind of make me feel really safe to go. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that people have those spaces. In, in an ideal world, we'd all be able to express ourselves everywhere. Um, and I think that's the world I want to work towards. But people do have to think about their safety. And unfortunately for um, lots of LGBT people, there's, there's danger in, in presenting yourself uh, very different to the mainstream. And that makes me sad. But um, I do, you know, think they're very real risks. So I don't always take that risk. One more question. Um, I think what helped you, because um, I was reading the bit about wanting to be like a normal flamingo, what helped you combat the need to feel really normal? Um, uh, that's a really good question. Thank you, Carl. Mm -hmm. um, I so, like as a writer, you want to be able to write about anything and everything, but um, as a black and gay writer, I'm often expected to write about black and gay issues. And so um, if I write about something else, um, it will still be looked at as a black gay man wrote this. So what's the metaphor there? What's he really trying to say? And I could literally have just been enjoying watching some coots on a pond, but someone might be like, well, a coot is black with a white part on its head. So does that mean it's about being mixed race or not fully black? Like, <laughs> and when I, when I choose images for my poems, I think, oh, what would someone read into that? Um, and I think being a writer, you feel very aware of the power of words, you know, and I, I kind of listen to how words are used, whether it's by our politicians, whether it's by, um, you know, friends and family, like I'm forever saying to people, oh, you can't say that. And they're like, oh, Dean. You're, but I'm like, no, just think about how you use your words. Like, um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of sensitive to that. Um, so, I, but I think that sensitivity is what makes me a good writer. And so I think if I was quote unquote normal, I wouldn't notice all these things um, about, you know, my identity and other identities. I, I, I try to be a good ally to many communities and because I've got friends from lots of different walks of life, I notice things and I notice discrimination, not just that that affects me, but affects other people. And so I think that observation and that kind of look, the way to see the world as maybe an outsider or someone that hasn't always felt like they fitted in. Um, I think it makes you uh, probably an artist that um, can appeal to many people because lots of people feel like outsiders at different points in their life. So I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's a blessing when I think about it. And so I'm glad you asked that question because at first I was like, oh no, I do just want to be normal. But actually, no, I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> no one's normal. Like I think of right now, we're talking about what's the new normal, mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah. that kind of, and well, something yeah. better, I hope, because the old normal was like very, um, you know, very skewed towards certain groups in society and very unfair. And um, I think now we have a chance to work towards fairness and, and equity. And I think that would be wonderful to see the new normal be something that includes more people, um, hopefully everyone, um, fairly. Wonderful question, Carmen. Family is a really big theme in the book. And uh, Michael comes from a very loving family with an absent dad, um, but a wonderful Uncle B. Yeah. And so I just wondered how important that was, how important it was to portray Michael's family like that, you know? supportive oh I, a lot in tension hmm. i think uh it was important for him to have a supportive family i um i didn't i didn't want it to be unbelievably supportive like i wanted there to be some tension like you said but also um you know an overwhelming sense of of love and um you know i think with the missing or absent father Uncle B steps in and is a great role model for Michael. Mm. And I think, you know, as 
as an adult, I've realized, you know, role models don't even have to be family members. You can have role models from, from everywhere. But when I was younger, and I think this is true of Michael as well, he does, you know, want a family role model, male role model, and that is important to him. And so I wanted to honor that. And um, so Uncle B was a really important character. I actually had in an earlier draft of the book, two uncles, one from the Jamaican side and one from the Cypriot side of the family. But my editor thought one uncle was plenty. So <laughs> we had to pick one and we picked the Jamaican uncle. Um, but um, it was, and then we've got the, obviously the um, Cypriot grandfather. Mm -hmm. And so the, the moments with the grandfather are really important. And that relationship is, um, you know, because the grandfather's in Cyprus, he's not as physically present, but I think that relationship's really important. And, um, you know, with it being, um, it was Father's Day yesterday and I was, I was reflecting on this a lot and I've written a lot about family and fathers and grandfathers and uncles. And it's, um, it's funny, like, I don't know why we need gendered role models, but it seems to be the way it is. Um, and, you know, I don't know why, for example, as a, as a gay man, I feel like I need gay role models as well, but it's just the way it is. I think we need to see ourselves in people and I think it helps um, to see, you know, whatever positive role model um, reflecting some of your characteristics as well. Um, but the reason I wanted the family to be supportive to answer your question is because there's so many stories out there where people come out as gay or trans or whatever and are kicked out of home or are, are seriously bullied or are you know treated really badly have to run away or and i just i thought there's plenty of those stories out there this isn't going to be one of those stories um because yeah I, I i just think that doesn't have to be the way it is and also um i think I don't know, but I'm, I'm realistic about it as well. There's a poem at the end of the book called How to Come Out as Gay. And one of the first lines is like, don't come out uh, unless you want to. <laughs> I don't think there's any rush. Um, I think, you know, young people uh, can take their time to, you know, make these, uh, these kind of uh, proclamations to people because I think, you know, you can't take it back. Um, you can you can then make an amendment to it but once it's been said it's been said so you want to think about when you're ready to say it and who you're ready to say it to and do you feel like you can you can trust them trust them with that information and will you be safe um, I think that's what's most important um, because you know when you're an adult and you've got your own place or you know you can be independent then it doesn't matter if people reject you, but I think family, it's really challenging time. You know, I think of those, because I was seeing lots about young people during lockdown, you know, being with family that may be homophobic or transphobic and having to really make themselves smaller and, and, and go back in or, or, or kind of keep their, um, their identity a secret from their own family and that um, must be really difficult. So, you know, that shows why school and um, other safe spaces like youth clubs are so important to give young people a chance to be themselves and express themselves um, if they can't do it at home. Um, and I think even Michael's mom is worried when he's younger, when he's got a Barbie doll, she doesn't actually want him to take it out of the house. She's happy for him to have it but she is nervous of other people's reactions. And I think a lot of time parents are scared of the world outside rather than, you know, their own child. They're not scared of their child. They're scared of how the world's going to treat their child. And um, that can manifest itself in, in some, some, some really um, hurtful things being said and done. But I think it's coming from a place of fear rather than hatred from my point of view. Just, but that's just one, one opinion. There's redemption there too i don't know whether you think that dean that it's maybe that's the lightness that you deal with all really quite tough issues yeah and there's forgiveness yes. um i think you know michael's say religion isn't necessarily uh, um deeply explored you know you know he comes goes to religious schools and you know that he kind of um has a, a sense of biblical stories and and they kind of are referenced in the book but you don't actually hear him talk directly about God or his relationship to God and he doesn't pray in the book because I've just been reading again noughts and crosses and I was really noticing how much they pray 
And I was like, wow, they pray a lot in this book. Um, whereas I think Michael doesn't pray, but he does practice, I think, some Christian values of forgiveness. And, um, you know, he has um, some friends, you know, who have hurt him, or not even friends, like people in the book who have hurt him, come and apologize to him later, and he is willing to forgive and um, move on. And I think um, that's something that I think is really important because I think holding resentment can really eat you up inside. And I think um, I see people being re very resentful um, and not even like for people that are not in their life anymore, but still holding that like vitriolic resentment. And I think we're not gonna move forward with that kind of energy. So I wanted to see Michael um, like, He's a fl flamingo, not a duck, but a lot of things are like water off a duck's back. Do you know what I mean? And so he, he, he does experience and often it washes over him. He's like, okay, that's, that's them. That's what they think, but that's not, I'm not going to internalize that and make that my issue. Um, and I think that was important. And maybe he's, you know, Maybe, maybe that's not always possible for us. Like things are going to hurt us and, and people are going to let us down in ways that feel unforgivable. Um, and I think Michael comes to forgive quicker than many of us would. Um, but I think forgiveness is possible. And I wanted to make that a theme of the book. So, you know, people are redeemed because they do forgive. And there are other people that just disappear and they don't come back. So we don't know what Michael thinks about them because he doesn't mention them again. You know, so um, it's only the people that come back and, and realize the error of their ways that Michael has the opportunity to forgive. Other people, I guess he just forgets about them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think drag culture is really interesting because it provides that um, sometimes for people that don't have the kind of biological family support, drag has like a family structure. So like when you join a drag family, there'll be a drag mother, someone who's um, older or more experienced that will take you under their wing. And sometimes there's drag father as well. And they will kind of guide the house and the, the group and uh, be there to give you support, whether it's coming up with a performance or whether it's to do with something in your real life. Um, whether it's makeup tips or, or, you know, how to pay the rent or whatever's going on. And I think, um, you know, I've been involved in, in drag and not in a kind of serious way, because I think my most serious thing is my writing. And I had to really choose whether or not I'd um, kind of be in a drag family or focus on my books. And I was, you know, invited to be in a drag family and I had to kind of say, actually, I won't be able to do justice to the family. I've got to uh, focus on my writing. And now I've kind of got a literary family and I find mm -hmm. um, other authors have adopted me. I've got some older authors um, that give me advice and support. And, um, you know, and that's another family that you can find. So I think there's lots of times in your life where um, you'll find, you know, new family and uh, people that kind of take on um, mentoring or almost parental roles to you. And one day you'll be doing that for other people as well. And it's just, mm -hmm. I've mentored people and it's just a really rewarding thing to be able to give people support that um, other people in their life can't. And I think we expect a lot from our family. They, they, they only know what they know. And if we have an identity that's wildly different to theirs, they don't know how to support us unless they've done some reading or done some research um, or ask around, you know? And so um, we have to realize they're learning with us. Like if you're a, a LGBT person in a family where no one else is, then they've got to learn with you what that means. And they won't automatically know how to support you. So they may need to do reading. You may need to do reading. Um, you might need to watch some documentaries with them or visit some websites with them or go to some groups with them. It takes time to, to learn this stuff. And just like we're learning who we are, our families le are learning who we are and we change all the time as well. Um, I just wanted to ask that, like, obviously it's really important to get lots of different voices and hear lots of different voices. So do you have any authors or influencers or other people who you would recommend we read or listen to? or explore yeah. it. Yeah, I think definitely if you like this idea of a novel in verse, The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo is really brilliant. Hold on, I'm gonna go grab the books, they're right in front of me, hold on. <laughs> okay, so this is The Poet X. 
by Elizabeth Acevedo and it's a novel in verse and it's really beautifully written and it focuses on a, on a female character and her twin brother as well. So there's a lot going on in that relationship and also family and also there's a romance in there which is really beautifully written. Um, for kind of the more um, kind of, uh, this is quite a serious story dealing with like um, the 80s and um, New York and this is dealing with like LGBT issues, especially um, the kind of the AIDS crisis. And this is written from a teenage perspective and does it really well. And I've never seen a book from a teenage perspective about this. And it's just done so beautifully. Um, and then, you know this, right? Heartstopper, everyone loves Heartstopper. So this is just so cute. And I just, I love, uh, you know, graphic novels and, and comics. And so I think this is a really gorgeous one. So um, those are a few I'd say to check out. Do you want to say? Can I, can I recommend one more book? Hold yeah. on. Yeah, so all of Juno's work, and Juno was really cool in compiling this. Juno kind of approached us, and um, it's got a real variety of authors. So you've got stories and poetry and artwork in this book, and um, they did a call out for new voices as well. So there's a, some established authors and new voices in here. So I just think this is a good kind of starter pack. Like, and if you like anyone in here, you can go and read more of them or, or seek out their work. So um, I'd, I'd recommend Proud um, very much. And I do have that in the library as well. Yay. <laughs> That's great. Thank no. you. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks students for tuning in. Um, whether you asked questions or whether you stayed and listened, I really appreciate having some people to talk to. Um, <laughs> and thanks teachers and everyone for organizing this. And um, yeah, I hope all your other events go really well. And um, if you, you tag me in tweets, I'll, I'll retweet and, yeah. and share so that people know about it, okay? We will. Oh, thank you so much, you will do. All right, awesome. Lovely, okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye everyone, okay. thank you. Hi, Chilton High School, happy Pride. And um, my name is Dean Atta. I'm a poet and an author. And I think a great place to see yourself is in books. So um, if you don't see role models in your everyday life, um, turn to some great books that can make you feel um, part of the LGBT community. There's lots of them out there. And um, if you are an ally, uh, read some books about LGBT lives and it will help you better understand and support your friends and family. Um, so thank you for doing this and happy Pride everyone.